Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and on behalf of SSF and our faculty and our wonderful fellows here, it's a great uh, honor to have you here at our STED Talks. STED stands for Spine Technology Education, and the D is a triple D. It's discovery, discussion, and debate. And uh, we're really honored today uh, to have Dr. Jeff Wong with us. Uh, he's the Vice Chairman of Orthopedic Surgery and Neurological Surgery and Chief of the Spine Service at the University of uh, uh, South California. Um, uh, he is a phenomenal and uh, well-respected surgeon, probably one of the most well-respected and recognized names in spine surgery this day and age. He is the immediate past president of the North American Spine Society, uh, past president of AO Spine International, and the list of accolades goes on and on. He's an innovator and one of the main uh, pioneers in modern bone graft technologies. And he's a very active uh, clinical and laboratory-based uh, fellowship at USC. Uh, he'll talk about novel technologies in spine surgery. And again, this is a very important topic in our field as we have so many questions to answer. As is our custom with TED Talks, we try to have a couple of evocative cases uh, that will serve as a foundation for discussion and as an introduction to the bigger picture. Uh, three of our fellows will present this morning on three cases which illustrate some of the complexities and challenges of the introduction of new technologies. Without much further ado, it's a great pleasure and privilege of mine to introduce our first fellow, Dr. Cliff Pierre. Dr. Pierre. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Clifford Pierre. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. I completed medical school and started neurosurgery residency training at the University of Rochester. Uh, this morning, I'd like to discuss a spine case of ours, a 67-year-old female uh, who uh, presented in our virtual COVID uh, telemedicine clinic with worsening severe low back pain that she um, continued to have after a recent fall on Valentine's Day. Uh, she had stated that her symptoms were worse than her, her prior symptoms from recovering from a remote surgery that she had on New Year's Eve. Uh, she had endorsed uh, right lower extremity pain that uh, was um, uh, activated and exacerbated by standing. Uh, she denied any neck symptoms or pain at that time and um, doesn't have any uh, urinary or bowel dysfunction. Uh, she has a, a, a list of comorbidities specifically for lupus, obesity, and osteoporosis, uh, and also was recently diagnosed with von Willebrand's disease. Uh, she lives independently at home, uh, uses a service dog for assistance in um, mobility, and again, noted in her most recent past surgical history, a L45 laminotomy with a L45 interspinous device, uh, specifically Coflex. This was her physical exam. Uh, again, just noting some uh, uh, mild lower extremity weakness on the right in her uh, knee extensors, as well as some decreased sensation. And then um, again, she at this time she was ambulatory using a walker. She had missed some of her physical therapy sessions uh, due to uh, the COVID pandemic that was uh, taking place all over the world. And um, this is some representative images of her uh, scan at this time, a CT lumbar spine, noting again, spinalisthesis at four five uh, with a, uh, Spinous fracture at L4 and left deviation of her coflex device. These are some of the axials. And this is just a scout image from the CT scan. And then again, these are just flexion extension films. So, uh, Cliff, yes. in your home institution in New York, did you used to use these interspinous devices? Were they used by your attendings there? They were not. They were not used uh, by our attendings. Um, uh, one of our attendings formerly used to use the uh, uh, X-Stop. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, they did not use any of these technologies. I'm sure they were discussed. Were there reasons given why they were not used anymore? Uh, some of the reasons, uh, it, it sort of went out of favor from those who didn't train with it at the time. And then again, uh, they, uh, at that institution, uh, progressively used, uh, again, preferred to uh, do more of, of, to use the modern technology with fusion and, um, and inner body devices at that time. So. 
Rod, uh, is the use of a Coflex device in this osteoporotic patient uh, uh, reasonable? She had a relatively stable grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis, high grade stenosis. So uh, was this just an irrational use of the device by myself? Uh, no, I think, um, I think this is not, um, I think, you know, for a patient like this with soft bone, um, this is actually, I think, a good indication to do it. Um, clearly, uh, her she had probably a little bit more instability mm -hmm. than what was thought. But no, I think this was a very reasonable option. Yeah, and we discussed uh, all the options at the time, and uh, she astutely wanted to proceed with the Coflex device versus a, um, a more extensive surgery with the um, fusion. Cliff, what would have been the problem with a fusion in uh, this patient, um, given her osteoporosis? I mean, you see some of the vertical striations on the sagittal CT. So, so what are the, some of the problems with that in a fusion, if a fusion was done? Um, outside of being a more extensive surgery, um, again, we would uh, have to consider, due to her poor bone quality, she was on chronic steroid use, so significant osteoporosis, consider uh, possible augmentation um, as well. Um, uh, so, so that would be one of the considerations in doing a, a fusion as such. And then, uh, again, the, the controversy, which I'll discuss later, is a, a, the, the uh, indications for uh, Jason Sangman disease um, secondary to a fusion versus using these uh, uh, interspinous devices. So bone fixation and then adjacent segment degeneration. Correct. Uh, do we have Dr. Wong live, Lee? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Hi, Jeff. Did you see this hey. case? So uh, I did this case. I take full responsibility for this. This was an iterative, careful discussion. Um, is this, was this crazy of me to do an inner spinous spacer? I'm not asking for justification, but. <laughs> no, no, I mean, so what's interesting to me is, you know, how, how, did, how long before this failed um, did you put it in? Was it like right away or did, did it actually do pretty well for some period of time? Clinically, she did very well. In retrospect, we think that it failed probably at around uh, one month, but she did very well until she fell again and then she started to develop a progressive spondylolisthesis. She had a very stable, uh, subtle spondylolisthesis, but she had more fluid in her joints than what I usually like. So. Yeah, so, so the bottom line, she was doing well. And, and had she not fallen, do you get a sense of whether or not this would have just held up for maybe a few years? I will never know, but again, she, she had an accidental fall, so it was not a neurologically induced uh, fall. It was a true traumatic kind of a fall. So I think that there was some violence imparted on it. And again, the, uh, it was very hard to sort out everything because our visits were virtual only, and she could not go to PT. But up to that point in time, she was thrilled with the decompression, and it seemed to be a success story. So we'll never know. But again, this was a high-risk patient for the she was from the word go, as Cliff had pointed out, and she very early on, probably about six weeks or so, failed. So, so the question to you is: first of all, is this a device technology, without going specifically into the manufacturer that you use, and um, what is your impression in terms of uh, the failure, the true failure rate of those? Because most of the articles that I'm aware of were company sponsored or the surgeons had a pretty significant sounding conflict of interest. So a compound question, sorry for that. No, no, and the, the, that's really kind of the, the issue here is um, you, you look at the original studies that, that were published on the, the initial data and you look at sort of, you know, who did well, who didn't do well. And, and I think as spine surgeons, we have to kind of take that as face value. And the unknown is whether or not um, there was some inherent bias or some unconscious bias in there just because there are surgeons involved that, that have, um, may have a relationship. They may actually love this technology, and there's that confirmation bias that we all kind of try to avoid, but sometimes it's unavoidable. You know, it, 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 this, is, this is a great uh, case example for, for this session just because, you know, when, when I'm aware of the initial studies is that the, the vast majority of failure, actually, the patients did very well if you look at the studies. Um, if you look at the control group uh, versus the, the, the implantation, they actually did very well. It's my understanding that the failure rate was mainly due to the device, like one of the, the tangs broke off, but it wasn't like massive failure like this. And so um, here, this illustrates a lot of things. Um, just at face value, basically looking at the results of the study, you would say that it's, it's successful. So it would convince people to consider trying it. 
And then the failure rate, I, I just didn't see failures like this. So this is like some unknown failure um, that, that was not involved in the study. And someone might look back and say, well, you know, were there other failures like this that we just didn't pick up? Or, or maybe it may even be accusatory and say, you know, were, there, were they kind of hidden? So thank you, that's a great answer. So the big question is, um, should we have for new devices, and you'll probably address that in your talk, so don't preempt your talk too much there. Uh, should for newer devices be a registry be uh, requested or imposed so we can have a better tracking of what actually happens in the real world scenario? That is exact, that, that's an excellent point. I think there are a lot of new technologies that they're not tracking the outcomes, they're not tracking the real data. And um, if it's being used now, especially for example, in the area of uh, say stem cells where people are paying cash for that um, and, and people are making money right now, um, why would the company want to get any potential negative data? Uh, you would like to think that people would want to know the real data and really how, how what the outcomes are. But I absolutely think we should we should study all new devices and really track the outcomes. So I want to conclude with this case. Jeff, what would you do? So we have a pretty, yeah, thank you, Cliff. Yep. Uh, great minds think alike. <laughs> we do. So uh, what should we do now? We have a, a clearly unstable, almost bordering on grade two spondylolisthesis. Um, the PARS is intact. Um, should we do a fusion now? Should we just uh, do a further decompression? And this is a very osteoporotic patient. Uh, how should we accommodate for that uh, poor bone stock? Yeah. Um, at this point, I think it's unavoidable. If she's very symptomatic, I think you have to proceed with the fusion. Um, I, I'm not arguing for like some huge, um, huge procedure on her. I would just probably address the level if, if that really is where the symptoms were. Um, and so I do think a fusion would be reasonable. Uh, I, I will say this, I have seen people with uh, interspinous devices uh, at one, maybe two levels. I've seen them fail and I've done fusions just at those levels. Uh, I would just get full length films and reassess them because I, I can think of a couple cases where they just kept progressing uh, and they had sort of a, a like a pelvic mismatch and things like that. And it just started this cascade and they ended up with the T10 to pelvis. There's one patient that ended up with the T4 to pelvis. And when you take those cases and you look back at this little tiny uh, device, now argu arguably you could say that would have happened if you had done a fusion to begin with. But it, these little tiny devices that are minimally invasive and they're touted as being sort of the newest technology can lead to pretty big surgeries. All right, Cliff, please take us through the rest of the case. And so these are operative images. Um, again, what we did was we proceeded with removing the device and uh, with the posterior approach, uh, continuing to do a, a decompression revision and a posterior three column osteotomy at L45, just staying at a single level with augmentation with the uh, uh, PMMA um, cement on the screws. And then uh, we in included a cross link at said level. We were able to get good reduction of her um, of vertebral bodies, L4 and 5, and uh, reduce her listesis there and she again noted uh, reported improvement in her symptoms and was discharged on post-operative day four so we haven't seen her yet um, in follow-up but uh, she's had improvement and so uh, as we were discussing again not only just regarding registries but are going to follow up data from a lot of these devices this most recently published in a, a journal um, systemic medicine uh, back in March, uh, just a uh, systematic meta-analysis review, uh, what they were able to do, uh, 10 randomized control uh, studies comparing decompression alone versus coflex and fusion. And uh, this is uh, some of the tables, uh, including some of the complications that occurred with using the coflex versus do, uh, doing a coflex and fusion. And uh, again, what they noted was uh, the coflex group uh, did uh, better with respect to the outcomes than uh, decompression alone, and or just as good. And uh, um, regarding ODIs and uh, visual analog scale, and uh, their, th this was their uh, concluding statement from the paper itself. Mm. They had a lower incidence of complications um, using the Coflex device. So than decompression only. Correct. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Cliff. Our next case will be presented by Dr. Ben Shell, and I'll ask him to introduce himself, and it'll bring up a different device technology, which has come and gone. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ben Shell. I'm one of the other spine fellows here at Swedish. I'll give you a quick talk about another, like Dr. Chapman said, a novel technology that's uh, may not be as in favor as the CoFlex. 
Uh, so the seven-year-old male uh, presented originally um, to us uh, back in 2017, um, had prior spine surgery back in 2007, which we'll review here in a second, um, failed conservative management for us, main complaint is this unilateral leg pain and weakness. And again, he'd had this surgery back in 2007 as part of an original uh, FDA trial of this device uh, at an outside hospital. <clears throat> and so he had actually done well for about eight years, eight or nine years from the surgery. It relieved his original uh, symptoms, which were similar to what he was representing with that unilateral radiculopathy, radiculopathy and foraminal stenosis. Um, and he'd, so here's some flexion extension films over those show a little bit there. Um, and so he'd actually done pretty well. Uh, for a very long time, but was beginning to uh, have his reemergence of his uh, original presenting symptoms. Here's some uh, CT scans as well, um, all pre-op, uh, but we ordered once he came to us. <clears throat> and so what this system is, is called a total facet arthroplasty system. You can't really see it well on these CTs, uh, but here's a schematic little cartoon. I have a couple of these coming up. And so what this system was designed to do uh, was to uh, take away that facet arthropathy and uh, <clears throat> that facet arthritis, that you know, um, one level disease. So uh, this gentleman himself was actually part of one of the phase three clinical trials uh, for this particular device. There were three at the time. Uh, this was only one of them. <clears throat> And this is kind of how it was placed. It had these non-threaded anchors that would go into the pedicles, <clears throat> excuse me. And so what you would do is you would inject cement uh, through the pedicles with cannulas and then uh, simply over drill and then slide these non-threaded anchors into the individual pedicles. And then it would themselves, uh, there on the left, the uh, lighter gray ball would slide vertically, <clears throat> very similar to the facet, facet uh, action would, and it would, maintain the balance coronally, uh, not letting it slide because there's that lip on the outer side, but that ball would slide uh, up and down to allow for flexion extension. So some of the original studies uh, was designed to improve the quality of the motion there. So one of the original studies uh, back in 2007 uh, that kind of propelled this was that it would show that compared um, to this particular study that was a cadaver study. So they would, uh, they took the native spine and they tested it and then they took um, an injured spine that they would take out uh, the facets as well. And so the TFFAS system compared to a native spine had an increase of 81% flexion, or I'm sorry, 81% of the original flexion, 68% of the original extension. The only one that it increased on, it actually increased in axial rotation compared to the native spine. Um, and so the uh, second study here, um, compared it to a, the arthroplasty system compared to a posterior spinal uh, instrumented fusion. So a traditional um, T-lift approach, that, sorry, uh, just posterior spinal fusion, no uh, inner body. And um, so they would, they looked at the biomechanical forces actually on the pedicles themselves. And so with the TFFAS, they had more force in flexion and axial rotation on the, um, on the system, as opposed to the fusion, where it actually had more force in extension and lateral bending. So <clears throat> didn't really provide them much uh, data clinically. These are all just um, uh, cadaveric studies, but they did let them know kind of actually how the system was working and what it, where it was restricting and, and kind of helping motion. Uh, so again, here's our gentleman. He's 70 years old. Uh, he's 10 years out from his original surgery. Uh, he had the PMMA injected, um, and then this uh, implant system, this is, it was his only surgery, so this will be his second spine surgery coming to us. Um, he's got that unilateral radiculopathy, unilateral pain and weakness, and he has failed conservative management. Um, and so now he's presenting to us. So what do we pretty, do? And pretty significant stenosis on CT myelogram. Correct. At correct. the levels. Yeah, so we can go back. Right there. At, yep. at the index level of 4 or 5, yes, sir. moderate at 3 4, and 5 1 had facet arthropathies with foraminal stenosis. So, Dr. Wong, Jeff, uh, facet arthroplasties. I'm not calling you old, but you've been around the block for a while. Is this something that you've done in the past? And so what's your perspective on uh, the question of what happened to facet arthroplasties? Was this a bad idea for the start? Um. Boy, there was a, there was there was a time where uh, there were a lot of crazy devices. I always wondered what happened to this thing. Uh, and you know, when I'm looking at this, and this is kind of an aside, I think the the human body is amazing. You'll do a single level T lift, and there won't be any loosening of the screws, but maybe it didn't quite fuse all the way, and the patient has pain. You put this device in there, and for eight years, this patient's pain free, and this thing's moving. It's all these moving parts. It's kind of amazing. 
Um, you know something, there was a time where there were a ton of uh, facet-like replacements. Uh, I guess, you know, there's a question, and I, I kind of alluded to this in my talk, at what point do you, you don't want to stifle new technology, but at the same time, boy, when you look back, some of the stuff just, you know, doesn't really make sense, or you look at it and it just seems so crazy. Uh, and so where is that balance between stifling new technology? And, and what if this had turned out to be the greatest thing ever uh, for this this thing? And, and if we had stunted it before it uh, came out, um, then we would have done a disservice. So, you know, I always wondered what happened to this thing. I look at this thing now and it just seems so obtrusive. It just is, is huge. But again, did it, can you argue that it actually accomplished the results for eight years? I mean, you're 10 years out. You said eight years, I think this guy was doing well. Yes, yes, sir. He had original surgery in 2007, and then he kind of started to reemerge back in like 2015, 2016, and then represented to us in 2017. So he'd been having on and off symptoms kind of slowly coming back. But yeah, so he did well, uh, you know, clinically great for eight to nine years. Do you think maybe it failed because just of progressive wear and tear, progressive foraminal stenosis because of the motion, and maybe progressive central, a little bit of central stenosis because you were. I mean, you probably had to preserve some of the anatomy to put this device in. Uh, could you argue that it was actually successful? I, I think you can definitely argue that it was successful. I think uh, if you could tell a patient today in clinic, I'll do a surgery and I'll give you eight great years, one not so, one 50-50 year, I think a lot of patients would take that. Yeah. The big question is what should we do now and is the surgery that we now have to do as a rescue surgery more invasive and does it put the patient at a greater risk or not? Uh, Jeff, what would you do? Uh, I think you, you've got to go in there. I think you probably have to remove the device. You have to do a full decompression. Um, the fact that it's cemented in, it's going to be tough to get that stuff out. You probably have to go to the adjacent levels. There's probably a little stenosis at 3-4 that you probably have to address. But as far as stabilizing it, you may have to go above and below um, just to get anchors. Uh, and, and you might really trash the bone trying to get those screws out that are, are those posts that are cemented in there. Mm -hmm. You appreciate, uh, exactly. So why don't you go forward, Ben, and show yep. us what was done. Uh, and just to kind of touch on uh, what happened to all these. So the, the three systems that were out, um, the TFFAS never made it past uh, stage three um, of the clinical trials. Uh, the Arcus um, was actually bought up by Globus, and they own the technology, but they've never pursued it. Um, and then the third system uh, never made it uh, past phase one. And so this is what we did. Removed the system, uh, the original TFFAS system, uh, left those uh, pedicles alone since they already had the hardened cement. Uh, and then we, like you said, extended it up a level uh, in each direction, cranially and caudally, uh, with inner bodies at each level to get that um, anterior column, oops, sorry, anterior column support and relieve that foraminal stenosis uh, with wide decompressions um, at the uh, index levels. How did the patient do? We just saw uh, him. Phenomenal. Before. Yeah, this he did great. We just saw him. Uh, he's at his two-year follow-up. Uh, complete resolution of symptoms, and uh, he's he's doing amazing. What are those S1 screws? Are those true S1 screws? They look kind of long. Uh, so they, I, they're a little bit of a hybrid between the S1 and the uh, S2 screws. So yeah, they. The Ailer screws. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Jeff, is this kind of what you would have done? Is that what you described before? Yeah, I guess, you yeah, know, it's a beautiful result, beautiful alignment. Um, it, was it hard to reduce that? I assume that the, the steps where you went in the front first and having that mobility, you were able to reduce it, and then you, you it looks like you put the screws in minimally invasively from the back? We actually no, did it open, open, and we did a interdiscal osteotomy, and uh, it was a bear to get some of those uh, uh, levers out. They were... <laughs> Three of the four, one was completely loose and three were socked in and we had to use everything in terms of uh, vise grips uh, uh, and create a rotatory force to loosen them up. So it was metal machine workshop. It was very difficult to take out. And one thing that I've told the fellows is when you put devices in, always think about how to get them out, sure. have an exit strategy. But he so, did, so yes, were, were those posts loose? Because I remember the criticism or the concern at the time that these that this device was being proposed is that you're always going to be stressing that screw bone interface or that post bone interface and there was going to loosen. Were they actually pretty well cemented? One, one was loose and that's the one that we took out first and we were all very encouraged. Three took hours to take out. <laughs> we literally had uh, to try to pivot them out and they were frozen in there. So it was a 
very difficult uh, extraction. It was not uh, straightforward. I used all sorts of things from the general ortho closet that I thought I'd never, like a kuncher extractor. And we broke, I think, one or two vice grips trying to torque out these posts on their L, hand, uh, on their L handle. Nice. Jeff, may we ask you one more, uh, uh, show you one more case about enabling technologies? Sure. And this is Dr. Eric Heyman. And Eric, we have to kind of fast forward a little bit because yeah. we want to switch to Dr. Wong's talk Absolutely. in five minutes. Thank you. I'll speak. And that's fine, Jens. I can shorten my talk a little no, bit. No, no, no. You're, you're the main speaker. But we just thought that uh, this would just illustrate some of the things that you're going to talk about. Okay. Go with me. Um, so the so, case. Yeah, why don't you introduce yourself first? So my name's Eric Heyman. I'm a. Uh, one of the fellows from the neurosurgery side here at USF, um, or sorry, at SSF. Um, I'll be going to USF next year. Um, bear with me. Um, <clears throat> to join the faculty there. Um, the talk today I'm going to give, the case I'm going to present today is going to focus primarily on a failure of a, a relatively established technology, not necessarily an implant, but a uh, rather a uh, navigation. Um, as we all know, navigation is widely becoming accepted as, a, as you know, a technology well used in, in the, the lumbar spine, um, you know, both for open and minimally invasive cases. And I think uh, there was a int very interesting presentation given a couple back on how it's expanded innovation, um, expanded uses, uh, you know, outside of the lumbar spine, for instance, in complex cervical cases. Um, but Bear with me, let me start this far off. Right. Far right. Present, see where it says present. Present, up, right. up, right. one column up. Yes, there we go. Um, so, you know, this is well established and well approved in the thoracic lumbar spine, but I think the cervical spine, at least my knowledge, represents relatively new territory for navigation, and there's a good reason for that, um, which we'll get into this case. Unfortunately, I don't have all the images for the case. Some of the work was done outside of our system. Uh, this, this patient was actually, uh, done by a community spine surgeon, um, with the caveat that this person is a very good, very experienced spine surgeon, very technical comp and very familiar with minimally invasive technology. Um, it was a patient he initially saw um, outside of our system, a 74-year-old female with a history of rheumatoid arthritis with a, a long-standing progressive history of neck pain, suboccipital headaches, and progressive day dysfunction. She was full strength on exam, um, but on flexion extension imaging, she had evidence of subluxation of C1 and C2, so a pretty pronounced spondylolisthesis per his notes. Um, he opted to do a C1-2 fusion um, and uh, using a standard lateral mass pedicle screw construct, um, which he did with navigation assistance. Uh, unfortunately, when he got down there, he felt they could not safely place a left-sided uh, pedicle screw um, because of the narrow pedicle diameter and the very close proximity to the vert to the um, you know, to the canal, so he didn't feel there was enough of a corridor to go through, and therefore he opted to place a PAR screw on that side instead. Um, the patient did initially well, um, but six weeks post op returned to clinic um, with a uh, report return of her symptoms and loss reductions and evidence of hardware failure. Um, he therefore opted to use, revise the surgery um, and uh, extend the fusion down one level to C3, and this is the surgery where um, problems sort of developed. Um, Using navigation, when he explored the surgery, he found that essentially all the screws had lost, explained, uh, had become loose, explained the loss of reduction, and uh, therefore he opted to place bilateral C1, um, bicortical purchase C1 lateral mass screws, and then attempt to replace the C2 screws, and then um, initially been planning on doing uh, C3 lateral mass screws, but then after seeing the pedicle diameter at C3, he opted to do C3 pedicle screws. Uh, he was using an O-arm stealth type setup, so um, naturally as soon as he placed screws, he obtained an O-arm uh, spin to uh, confirm adequate placement of the screws. Well, the C1 screws looked good. Um, the C2 screws were problematic. The right C1 screw was crossing the uh, retrieval frame, in, and the, the left C2 um, screw was actually in the canal. Um, Similarly, both of the um, C3 screws were actually in the transverse frame in, to some degree. Um, it's a little hard to appreciate in the arm spin. Um, as a result, he removed the C2-3 screws. Um, he reported no evidence of bleeding or any other evidence of a vertebral artery injury. 
Um, he then revised these using navigation. Um, per his operative note, the post placement intraop CT looks good, although this was actually not uploaded, so it was a little hard to independently evaluate that. He also opted to leave the left C2 screw out. Um, the patient reportedly initially did well, but around post-op three um, had to decline, and he obtained a head CT, which demonstrated this large cerebellar territory stroke. Uh, interestingly enough, on the left side, I say interestingly enough because um, the patient's vertebral artery deficit uh, appeared to be on the right with loss of the right vert um, and compression of the left vert by the C3 screws, um, the left C3 pedicle screw. Um, he initially held off on re-exploration for fear of uh, disrupting a stable patient, um, especially since the, the, the right vert had occluded, but ultimately was persuaded to re-explore based on the concern that if the left pedicle screw compromised um, circulation, this patient would have a complete posterior fossa infarct. Um, he therefore took her back to the OR and revised her from a C1 to C7 fusion, skipping C2 and C3. Um, the patient did very well and made a full motor recovery per his notes. Um, and, which is consistent with the course of a cerebellar stroke, but nevertheless, this could have been a potentially disastrous complication if the patient had a right dominant vert. Um, in terms of safety, uh, this is actually something that's been looked at in the literature, and uh, while C1 lateral mass screws can uh, be placed with an acceptable complication, or on base navigation of C2 um, uh, pedicle screws can be highly fraught. Um, with a, with a high risk of uh, cortex violation ranging between three to 5%. Um, I'll open up for discussion. Why don't you go back to the uh, CT. So Jeff, this is the question of enabling technologies. Um, assuming this is a very reasonable, technically skilled surgeon, but maybe not that familiar with uh, uh, upper cervical instrumentation, where do you see the, the roles and the limitations and the responsibility of industry to kind of make sure that these new image guidance technologies um, are used appropriately and um, don't give a false sense of security? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's an unfortunate case. It sounds like yeah, things worked out well in the end, um, but I think there is always going to be a learning curve whenever you you enable new technologies for any of us. Uh, it, it, if I started a new technique, and yeah, you're an amazing surgeon, if you had to uh, learn a new technology, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve, and I think we just have to understand that no matter how amazing we think we are, when we, when we start this new technology, we're starting at, at ground zero. Um, the other thing is, is that maybe a comment to the younger surgeons, because I, as I'm going through this case and I'm looking at it, there's two things. Number one, you always want to be aware of all the different options, right? So you have translaminar screws, you have other ways of fixating into C2 and things like that. But one thing that kind of hits home for me is my, my fellowship director was the late Henry Bowman, and he popularized the, the Bowman wiring technique. And you know, it looks like there's still lamina here. Um, there's still spinous processes. I don't believe there was a, a laminectomy of C1. And so, you know, you could have easily wired this thing. Um, if you go back to the old papers, wiring structural allografts uh, not only allows you oftentimes to reduce C1 to subluxations, but it's very strong fixation. And if you burn through the pedicles, and especially when you said that the, one of the revisions they went in there and the screws were very, very loose, you know, you could always drop an a inner, uh, inner laminar wire uh, underneath C1, and you could wire it into the spinous processes. And if you put it through structural allografts, it's actually very strong and a very high healing rate. So don't forget about the old techniques. I have a fellow, uh, ex-Bowman fellow here, who wanted to say something about this. Uh, hey, Jeff. Um, I love the comment on uh, wiring, and I think that's why Jens uh, handed me the microphone. That's something I uh, will still occasionally do, and, and particularly for elderly and osteoporotic uh, patients. Uh, uh, and I, I, uh, I wanted to congratulate Jens and the fellows on a great program. I think uh, one of the themes that emerges that the fellows, uh, I always try to impart um, as a kind of a uh, an overarching uh, lesson is you really need to develop your own kind of personal algorithm for how you evaluate uh, new technology because what you learn today in terms of how you do spine surgery is going to be totally different tw uh, from what you're doing 20 years from now and uh, you know one of the one of the 
uh, uh, lessons that one of my uh, mentors passed on is never be the first to adopt new technology, but you also don't want to be the last. So if something does seem to be working in a, in the community, that that's maybe something to go after. Uh, there are other, obviously, other measures, and I think one of them is sort of common sense. And so uh, does does a new technique really make sense? So I'd, I'd list dynamic uh, fixation in that. So we didn't have a case of that, but the uh, uh, dynasty rods kind of came and went, right? And uh, uh, I always thought the phrase dynamic fixation is sort of a contradiction in terms, right? It's an oxymoron. So uh, it, as a fusion surgeon, you should kind of understand that may not be uh, the be all and end all. And there's a number of other things that are scattered in the dishes over the time that Jens and uh, Jeff and I have been, and Rod have been practicing. So uh, I share that as a take home. Great intro uh, to the lecture, Bob. Uh, again, I want to briefly introduce Dr. Wong and thank him for coming here. He's truly one of the most recognized names in spine surgery internationally. It's a huge honor to have him here. Immediate past president of NAS, uh, past president of AOSpine International. And the list goes on through all the main organizations. But most importantly, he is an incredible researcher and uh, clinician uh, and um, uh, one of those people who brings others together for a greater good. Uh, uh, Jeff, we're really looking forward to your talk on novel technologies in spine, and maybe we'll have a brief moment of uh, discussion time afterwards. Thank you for being here this morning. Great. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to, I think I share my screen. So if I do something incorrectly, please let me know. Uh, can you see my slides or are you seeing the preview? See the slides. Perfect. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the development of novel technologies, and I really want to thank Jens and Rod and um, Bob and all the people at SS, uh, SSF TV for allowing me to be the, the sort of the, the spine TED Talk uh, speaker. Uh, I'll first start with my disclosures. Um, I do get royalties for four products that I've designed. I do have some personal investment options, and I'm on the board of directors of several spine societies, and I don't think any of this is going to affect what I'm going to be talking about today. But I think the most important disclaimer is that these are really my own opinions, and this is not based on science. It's really based on my own personal observations, and what I'm about to say may not be correct, and it may differ from your own thoughts, and I, I fully recognize that. These are just my observations. Um, I am always self-conscious of the audience because if I start talking about new technology, there might be an expert, the world's expert sitting right in front of me. Or if I start talking about the economics, there's a world expert in economics sitting in front of me. And the other disclaimer is that I've always been in a university setting. So some of these views are coming from sort of that setting. And maybe in private practice, I, I might have some different thoughts. Um, the real title of my talk should be um, not just the development of novel technologies for spine surgery and kind of how we're going to move forward in the future, but what I really want to talk about is the real cost of novel technology. You know, I, I remember back when I was a young surgeon, I was at one of the, the meetings, and I remember there was like a new device coming out, and I was like on the exhibit floor, and the rep came up to me and said, well, don't you want to be able to access new technology? You, you don't want the uh, people keeping that new technology out of your hands if you think it's going to help your patients. And, you know, when, when companies talk to young surgeons like that, you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to be able to access that new technology. I want to be able to be on the cutting edge and things like that. But and, and in their defense, they're, they're absolutely right. They, they come up with new technology. They invested in it. But what I think we need to understand as spine surgeons is what is the real cost of introducing that new novel technology? And so basically, um, when I talk, when I give this talk, I want to look at things from a, a different angle. And my main goals of this talk is for, so you understand the processes and barriers in the development and usage of novel spine technologies for the future. So at least when you go forward in the future, and especially the young guys, when you go into your careers, you understand and can get a global view on the whole process and maybe how you can speed things up or maybe slow things down. The other thing is I, I want everyone to understand what is the true cost of bringing that new technology into spinal practice because what we may find out is that um, our future reimbursements can be affected by the choices we make today. And, and I think if you look back, it's exactly what's going on. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot. And this, this cartoon will come up in my talk several times where I think we might be shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit. 
And so this is an overview of my talk. I'm gonna start with just the development of new technologies. And I think the thing that we have to understand now as opposed to the past. Now, when I think of the past, I think of my father-in-law. He was a general surgeon, small town in rural Pennsylvania. So although he was a general surgeon, he was a jack of all trades. He fixed some fractures, some simple things, because in a small town in a rural community, that's what you have to do. He would see a patient, he'd bill for his services, he'd do surgery, he would use an implant, discharge the patient. And these were really isolated events. It's completely different now. When we see a patient, they have to be on your insurance plan, you have to figure out your payment model. If you wanna advocate for a new procedure, a new technology, is it approved? You're gonna discharge that patient, you're gonna be rated, patients are gonna grade you, they're gonna grade the hospital. You have poor uh, ratings, it may affect who comes to see you. And I think the difference is everything is related. So when I go through these processes of how we develop new technology, yet we have to understand that the things we do although it seems like it's an isolated event, actually is related to everything that we do. And so let's look at how we develop new technology and let's look at a timeline. So if you start on the left and you go to the right, um, this is the timeline to develop new technologies. And I just want people to understand the steps that are involved. So maybe if we go into the future, you can understand how you could modify those steps. So first is you come up with an idea and you have a patent. So you come up with a novel idea, you develop the IP and you wanna develop a patent. Well, there's a barrier right there because right now that we're seeing a plethora of uh, patent applications. If you look at this exponential growth of, of applications and as, a, as opposed to previous years, there's an explosion of a different number of patents. So it's harder and harder to get this through the patent office. In addition, we are flooding, especially in spine technology, we are flooding the patent office with multiple patents and it just takes more and more time. And the problem with that time is, is that when you get that patent, it's usually granted for 20 years or it's a design patent for 14 years. And it's usually the filing date of that patent. So bottom line is if it takes longer and longer to get it, the clock is ticking. And that might be a barrier right there if you sit there and say, it's gonna take me a long time to get this patent. Um, it, it may not be worth it because I'm only gonna have a little bit of time left when I finally get this out there and get it through the other approvals. But that could be a barrier. The next thing is FDA approval. Right? So you get your novel idea, you get your IP, but now you need the FDA approval. And this is a pretty complex process. Um, these are slides right from the FDA website. You might be low risk and you might go right into the market. It might be 510K, so maybe there's a predicate device, or maybe it's some new technology that's completely new and you have to do a PMA, which can cost quite a bit of money. Bottom line is, is that to get FDA approval, it's a long and complicated process um, and it can fail. And all the, the, the things that were invested into this in getting the IP and getting that period of time and then going through this process, potentially doing a pre-market assessment study, spending all that money, maybe you lose it all. And that could be a real barrier. Now, if you look at the 510 uh, 510K pathway, the average cost is 31 million. And there's about 4,000 of these applications each year. If you look at the PMA, the pre-market assessment, the average cost is 94 million. And I would argue with some biologics, it's probably gonna be higher and there's less of those filed per year. But um, you know, if we're gonna introduce new technology, um, there are certain requirements that we shouldn't change, right? We shouldn't change the safety or the efficacy. We have to demand evidence, but maybe going into the future, can we learn from some past failures and learn some lessons, right? And so here are some lessons. Maybe we can try to reduce these barriers because there probably is a little bit of reluctance to try new technologies just because so many have failed in the past. There are some devices that have gone for some indications that have not gotten those indications inside the United States uh, and they're being sold maybe in Europe or other countries, but you know, you can fail and uh, obviously people want to be in the US market. Uh, other things um, have, have successfully gone through this FDA process, but you know, there's a limited lifespan. So they weren't sold for many or new devices have come up. And so people have kind of lost their investment and they kind of look back and say, well, if I'm going to do this novel technology, go through all the patents, go through all the FDA approvals, and I'm finally going to get it to market and I have that clock that's ticking because my patent only lasts for so long, then uh, that could be a huge barrier. And then certainly your device, once you get out there, could have complications. We just saw a great example of a facet replacement that probably went through all the processes. It made it into patients. We just saw a case of one, and I don't see that being used today. A lot of investment that has been that has failed, uh, and again, it may only last 20 years. 
So how can we optimize this for the future? You know, maybe we need to scrutinize new technology. The picture I'm showing here to the young surgeons, you may sit there and say, what the heck is that? Uh, but I can tell you for those uh, older guys like me, we look at this and we realize there was a decade or more where these types of nucleus replacement devices were being touted at every meeting. You couldn't go to a meeting without seeing some studies on this, some type of nucleus replacement. There are probably five to 10 different devices out there that were in, being put into patients. And when I look back in 2020, I look back on that now and none of these are being used. I mean, I don't see anyone using them. I don't see any patients coming in with this class of uh, device implanted there. I'm not revising any of these. I, I go to the annual meetings of main major spine societies. I don't see any studies on this anymore. So an enormous amount of time and effort that has been complete, uh, well, I wouldn't say completely wasted, but I mean, that's currently not being used today. Do we need to have some type of vetting process, maybe support the ones that advance science and patient outcomes rather than just look at pure profit and which devices we can get out there? Maybe we need to eliminate the ones that are likely to fail or lead to complications, the ones that just don't make sense, right? Now, again, I don't want to stunt the growth of novel technology, but at the same time, there's a lot of stuff that has failed. And the more we flood the market and the, the offices, the FDA and the patent offices with all these different types of devices, then uh, it probably keeps the ones that might work from going in. Uh, so we know there's limited funding for new technologies and maybe we need a vetting process for the future. And that requires coordination and some people are gonna argue that's gonna stunt people's um, new technology growth. We're seeing a lot of innovations coming from companies and you know that, that's understandable. They're the ones that are coming out with the devices. But what I don't like to see is people working backwards. And what I mean by that is I've been to meetings where I remember when vertebral augmentation for osteoporotic fractures was big. I go to meetings and people would ask me questions about it and I'd sit there and say, oh, do you have some new technology on this? And they'd say, no, it's just a huge market. We'll find some device to go in there, but we just think it's a huge business opportunity. I think that's the wrong message, right? You don't want to work backwards. You don't want to sit there and say, well, there's a lot of money to be made in this area of spine surgery, so let's find some new technology that gets us in the game. I think it should be the opposite. It should be based on helping patients with, with technology that is amazing and then developing that. And I think if we did that, there'd be more successes. Now, say you get your patent, you get FDA approval, you still need a CPT code, otherwise you're not going to get paid for this. And this is where the controversy really lies because it's a hard process to get the, uh, the CPT code. Uh, everyone wants a category one code, which allows insurance companies to, uh, and the uh, RBUs to, to be assigned to it and get value. If you have a category two or a category three code, you know, it's some type of tracking code. It's a new technology code. You, the companies don't want that. So everyone wants a category one code. So this is a complicated process. I'm not going to go into the details on it. But I can tell you that it's time consuming, it's a huge barrier, um, and, and this is where the companies are really, really sort of lobbying the spine societies. Having been the past president of NAS, I can tell you that we were inundated with requests to lobby for the CPT codes for different technologies and things like that. And, and again, we are flooding not only the patent office, the FDA, but we're flooding our societies to support all these new technologies. And, and we'll have to wonder, you know, is it worth it for a lot of these? Now, do we have to have more scrutiny? Is there some vetting process? And this is where I think we might be shooting ourselves in the foot, okay? Now, this is something that I think that we really need to understand. Every time we get a new technology seeking a CPT code, we are going to examine the current codes. And so, for example, if you come up with a technology that relates to some type of decompression, it triggers any type of reevaluation of any other decompression which, within that category, and that's going to devalue what you currently do. And that's where I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot. I think we definitely need new technology that advances patient care, but we have to understand it's going to decrease your reimbursement. And here's what I mean by that. So cervical arthroplasty, great technology. In the appropriate patient, I, I choose that over fusion Young, in a young patient where I think it's appropriate, right? But um, if you knew that by the introduction of a cervical disc replacement, you're gonna devalue your fusion, you might sit there and say, you know something that it's worth it. it it's a technology that's worth it. Uh, I think it's good for patients. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
The problem is, is that what if you develop a new technology, and I don't mean to trash the, the one on the screen, and maybe I shouldn't have shown this one, but here's a new technology that I just don't use in my practice. I've never put one of these in in a patient. But if this, the introduction of this novel technology devalues everything that I do, it, you know, I have to ask myself, am I shooting myself in the foot? And this is what I'm talking about. Say this represents all the lumbar surgeries that you currently do in your practice. So this is all the different types of surgeries that you do for your lumbar spine. And you're introducing a new technology that you're going to use in 1.3% of all your lumbar technologies. Now, if that is a worthwhile technology for that 1.3% and it's completely good for patients, absolutely, it's great for that. The problem is, is that if you end up not using it or if you, it's limited use and you use it in only a fraction of your patients, but everything else you do in the lumbar spine gets devalued and you get less money for that, you have to ask yourself, did I shoot myself in the foot? And if I do this for every single device, and if I'm introducing 10 new devices a year, every time you introduce a new, new device, it devalues everything else I do for my surgeries, then you are kind of shooting yourself in the foot, unless that new technology is really worthwhile. And I think that's the key, is that technology worthwhile? So do we need to limit new technology? Do we need to vet them? Um, the bottom line is, is that the CPT codes is going to be determined uh, by the AMA House of Delegates. And unless we're in alignment, I can tell you we're shooting ourselves in the foot. And there's currently a code that the spine societies, the major ones, cannot agree on. It has to do with T-lift, which is a very common surgery. And I can tell you we're not aligned. So if we're not aligned, when we go to the CPT panel, there's a lot of internal medicine doctors, people outside of spine, they're going to be making decisions on what you get paid and things like that. Next is evaluation, right? So say you get the CPT code, we have to assign a value, and here's where we're shooting ourselves in the foot. This is how they determine the value of that new procedure, that new technology. How much time it takes you to do it, the intensity of the procedure, the risk involved, and the malpractice implications. Well, why do I say we're shooting ourselves in the foot? Because every time a new technology comes out, they pretty much go against every one of these, right? So don't they, new technology comes out and says, this is going to take you less time. Well, if it, if it does, then you shouldn't get paid as much. The intensity, if this is easier to use because it's new technology, well, if the intensity is less and the risk is less, you shouldn't get paid for that amount, of, for, for that procedure. And that's another way that introduction of new technology stunts the growth of, of what you do. Uh, for example, uh, everything is based on time. You get paid for your time. For example, Currently, if you use a peak cage for fusion, you get paid more than if you use an allograft. And it's purely based on time because it takes you longer to do that. There are other aspects of the valuation, the ease, intensity, risk involved, but it's really based on time. And so again, if you do an inner body fusion and you use a peak device, right now you get paid more because theoretically it takes you longer to do that. If you reassess that procedure and they, were, they would find that it doesn't take you longer to put the peak cage in than the allograft cage, then they're gonna devalue the, 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 the use of the, um, the peak cage. Um, the other example where it's devalued, let's go back to the cervical disc replacement, right? Which everyone agrees is probably a good technology. So um, if you're gonna compare that and you're gonna reevaluate ACDF, what if ACDF was valued as far as time 10 years ago when you weren't using microscopes, you didn't have the spinal cord monitoring, you didn't have all of the new things that make it eat a lot quicker, but it was based on using loops, a headlight, you know, things like that. And it took a certain amount of time and they assigned value for that. Well, what if they re-examine it now, now that we have a microscope, we have all these things and it takes you less time to do that ACDF. Purely by re-examining ACDF, they're going to decrease the reimbursements for the ACDF. And that could be triggered simply by bringing in new technology, which is the cervical disc replacement. So again, you're losing what you currently do. Reimbursement, not going to really go into it because I know we're limited in time, but we know that novel technology costs more. And putting increased costs in today's model just doesn't work. Um, and, and, and lobbying the spine societies, it, it, it's, just, it's just a little bit overwhelming, speaking on behalf of the spine societies. And then reimbursement, we know that it's not sustainable what we do now. It is not sustainable. Spine 
surgery is an easy target because we all do different things for the same pathologies. And again, if this cures cancer, if the novel technology cures cancer, by all means, we got to put it in there, right? But if it's just another pedicle screw or another device that doesn't really change the game, we have to ask ourselves, what role does it have? Are we shooting ourselves in the foot by bringing this in and, and losing what we currently get? This is what we are dealing with. Decreased reimbursements, increased denials, uh, drastically competitive implant cross, uh, contracts, uh, alternate payment models. We're seeing more patients with less resources, tighter financial margins, especially with this COVID pan pandemic. We're getting more incomes. Where does new technology fit into this? I'm almost embarrassed to go to my hospital and, and lobby for new technology that's going to cost more given this scenario when everyone's hurting financially right now. Uh, and as far as value-based care, I'm not going to go into that, but the bottom line is, is that what happens if people start saying it's going to be value-based care? So if we find that cervical disc replacement is more cost-effective than ACDF or single-level cervical radiculopathy or myelopathy from a purely financial decision, are they going to say you can no longer do ACDF for a single level because the cervical disc replacement is more cost-effective? Hopefully not. Or anterior surgery is more cost-effective than posterior surgery for myelopathy at one year or a posterior cervical fusion more cost-effective than ACDF, so you can only do that procedure. Now, I don't think we're gonna get there, but we have to understand that we have to gather the evidence uh, and show what we do works. Now, this is what really kind of bothers me and worries me, and this is where I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot. I heard one of the insurance companies earlier this year classified T-lift surgery as an outpatient procedure, right? More and more people are doing these minimally invasive T-lifts as an outpatient. And so you can still do it as an inpatient, right? But you have to justify doing it as an inpatient. And they'll still pay you for it, but it's moving towards outpatient. So we just, we just talked about what you get paid is based on time. Well, what happens if they base it on time for these guys that are doing it as outpatients, uh, doing it overnight stay, they send them home the next day, and maybe you can do that for, for these certain patients. Maybe you cherry pick the patients. But for a 500-pound patient with heart disease and chronic pain patient, that, that you, you probably can't do that chronic pain patient that weighs 500 pounds as an outpatient. But what happens if they reevaluate T-lift to say, we've reevaluated it, we've done a time thing, and these guys are doing it out, outpatient, that's what we're going to pay for. Then you've really shot yourself in the foot because then you're basically saying that all T-lifts are going to go to outpatient, and that's the new standard by which we're being judged, and we're shooting ourselves in the foot. You know... When I look to the future of spine, um, it's a huge problem. We're always going to have patients. We have to be mindful that these patients have pain. They can become disabled. Um, and, and we're always going to need to, we have to manage this problem. We have to manage new technology in this because the bottom line is, is that we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot because we're dealing with massive amounts of patients. What I can say is that we're not doing it right today. Let's take stem cells. I don't mean to trash any one person or one center, but you Google stem cells, you get all this stuff. Stem cells, stem cells, stem cells, come in and pay cash. Well, the bottom line is that's not the right way to do new technology. There's too many types of treatments. People are already making money. From a patient perspective, they believe that it's the greatest technology, even though there might not be any evidence. From an insurance perspective, they don't know what to make of it. And certainly the government doesn't know what to make of it unless we get a handle on this. And what happens if you have a stem cell treatment that worked? I can tell you right now, we're doing like three or four stem cell trials at our institution. You know, it, it's harder and harder to do a stem cell trial because there's so many are out there. There's too many out there right now and, and the development will be crowded. So I just think the way we're doing new technology now is not the right way. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the... Um, uh, reimbursement. And I want to show you this one. This is an, actually an interesting article. Uh, this was done um, in sports medicine. But the bottom line is they're basically saying that we, we have not changed our reimbursement in 30 years. And if you look at the uh, reimbursement now, they're basically saying it's like you go to McDonald's, you order a Big Mac, fries, and a drink. And bundling care is basically saying that you order the Big Mac and you get the fries and the drink for free. Um, and that's kind of the way we're going. And, and that's probably not the right way. And so I just want to finish by saying, I hope now you learn the true cost of the introduction of new technology into spinal practice. Basically, it eats away at what you're currently doing, which if it is worth it, it's, it, it's great for patients. But if it's not worth it, I think we have to be a little bit more 
vigilant on, on all these technologies that are coming down the line. You know, the great Abraham Lincoln said, the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. And uh, I think we need to watch what we do now so we don't shoot ourselves in the foot in the future. With that, I want to thank you all. Thank you uh, for having me as, as part of this TED Talk. Jeff, outstanding talk as always, and uh, very, very helpful and thought-provoking big picture perspective. Uh, uh, one question at the end here. Uh, if we have um, a, a way of greater accountability, would this be in form of a registry, and what time frame would we expect something to be successful for? Because right now we're looking at 30-day readmissions, 90-day uh, um, surgery success uh, for the disc arthroplasty. It was extended from two years to a five-year window. But what's the time frame for success or lack thereof? And uh, should we have uh, registries for larger-scale technologies? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I do think we need to study new technology, and we have to prove that it works. Uh, I think the problem as far as the time scale is that some of these things may fail late. Remember the BAK cages? When we were in early 90s, we were putting those in, and initially we thought they were doing well and they refused, and we found out later that they weren't healing, but we didn't find out about it for two years down the line. So there, I think there are some technologies with a shorter time follow-up that will be able to determine whether or not they're successful or not, but I think the long-term outcome is there. And that's why I think we have to look at these registries and gather this data and continue to follow them out and continue to question the value of what we do. One, one more question quickly, since you mentioned outpatient surgery centers, I think they have a great value proposition if done correctly, as always. Last night we had our interesting case uh, discussions through SSF TV and UCSF was uh, presenting, and Zig Bervin and Praveen Mumameni showed a case of a relatively young woman who had eight spine surgeries, I believe over two or three years, done in all in outpatient centers. And uh, literally, just a little here, a little there, she ended up with a completely catawampus, uh, crooked spine, eight surgeries later, and it required an eight-hour major overhaul surgery. Not one of those surgeries would have uh, come up as a red flag because the overall complications in each time were lower uh, than an open procedure. Probably, uh, but So nothing ever got flagged as an overt mistake, but the big picture was a, a pretty much a catastrophe. How do we police that? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I guess I guess in that situation, if you thought more globally, right? If you didn't look at just one that one episode of care from that one surgery, but you took the patient as a whole, if we could follow these patients globally and get that whole global picture, maybe we pick up on things like that. The problem is, is that you know, if you and, and I don't want this, but what if you went to one payer model, you had all the same medical records, so that. Whenever anyone saw a patient, they would have everything in front of them and they could look at the global picture. You might not see things like that, but I think there are inherent problems in doing that as we all would kind of figure out. Great, uh, uh, for now I'll talk, I'll pass the microphone to Dr. Skuyan and for closing comments. Jeff, I think that was a great um, talk and I think the case examples that you showed is very relevant because, you know, like artificial disc, for example, um, you know, it's a great technology, um, and I use it more and more in my practice. But like you said, it, it um, you know, it's certainly it's uh, it comes at a cost. Um, and even now, for example, when you look at like I'm a big fan of using the ProDisc C and the semi-constrained. I think it's a good device, but the newer versions that come out aren't necessarily better either. You know. Um, and they seem to be more, um, and I know now we, for example, people are doing two, three levels. So, you know, what started as a small procedure for adjacent level diseases now, you know, people I think tend to, sometimes with newer technologies, push the limits of um, what that is. And I don't know, you know, I wanted your, I wanted your opinion on just really quickly on semi-constrained versus constrained, because I know the FDA initially, you know, when they did all the artificial disc trials, it sort it seems like this area has expanded quite a bit in the last five years. If you could just comment on that, and then sure. we can wrap up. You know, I, I think that that's a great example of what we, we just don't know, because there are certainly devices that are you know, more constrained than others that are doing well, and then there are ones that are less constrained and, and also doing well. 
And, and so maybe it doesn't make that much of a difference, or maybe we're going to pick it up in certain situations. If we can get a little bit more granular, you know, maybe we'll be able to pick up which would be optimal for these certain patients. The problem is, is that we're not so much gathering the data for science. We're almost gathering the data just to get through these approval processes, post-market assessment and things like that. Um, if we really got into the science of it, uh, you, you know, we might be able to pick up those subtleties, but but the game isn't geared towards that. The game is getting your approvals, and and you know, someone, the government, or someone like CPT panel AMA, they, they set the code for, for the CPT for the reimbursement. And the, it's the rock. You know, there's all these different different entities that are determining parts of what we do. And I think you know, developing new technology, people are just trying to jump the hurdles. You know, it may not be in the interest of science. Um, it, it's more jumping those hurdles. We've kept you over time. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise and wisdom. We really enjoyed this lecture, and I think all of us walk out a little bit more enriched and uh, uh, stimulated for a more critical and thoughtful appraisal of the future. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.